Well, we'll get started. We're going to talk in the weeks ahead on the uh, book of Revelation. Uh, this is a, uh, a book that uh, I avoided studying a large portion of my life, or I avoided it, I think, because uh, there was a party line in the denominations and such like that I grew up in as to what uh, this book meant. And by most everybody else, I suppose, I subscribed to it to some degree, and yet there was an element in which I wasn't comfortable. And therefore, I uh, never preached on it, and I didn't teach on it, because I just didn't really know what the book was about. After uh, uh, some time, after I had made some theological translations and uh, was Presbyterian, I was asked some prophetic questions. And I decided, well, I need to take a look at this book. And so I started, uh, I started a study uh, about the book. And uh, the result was, uh, I actually did Sunday school classes on it. And I took those notes and I kept reworking them over a period of years. And I ended up <coughs> with this book here called Back to the Future. And you can see on there, if you care to obtain that book, there's some information where you can obtain it. Uh, and read it if, uh, if you'd like. I think it'd be helpful to you because I can certainly only give you a few things and there's a great deal more you know, in the book. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to get started with an introduction and after we get into the introduction or get through the introduction, we'll go verse by verse and through the book of Revelation see if we can make any sense out of it. Now, <clears throat> when looking at the book of Revelation, we are our confronted will have been addressing this book. They have looked at it uh, through various uh, spectacles, various points of view. And we want to talk about those points of view. We have a comment here, the blank. See, this book is a prophecy about times that have not yet occurred. Now, the answer to that question is the future. It's because that's one of the ways to look at this book, is to see the, the book about, a uh, content about, the future, and only about the future. And in every age, it's about the future. Uh, it never ceases to be about the future because the world has not come to an end yet. And this is basically about the end of the world. That's the point of view of the futurist. Now, something dawned on me one day when I was thinking about that. We all know in Thessalonians there is an uh, important passage that talks about the rapture of the church, the people of God how they are caught up to heaven. That's a major uh, of doctrinal importance about prophecy and about the, the things that are going to happen at the end of the world in, in our future. And uh, as I pondered that, I thought, you know, I can't uh, remember that ever being discussed in the book of Revelation. If the book of, book of Revelation is about the end of the world, then why is this very important doctrine, the rapture, never addressed in the book of Revelation. And it is, it is not. It is not addressed anywhere from cover to cover. Uh, that made me suspicious <coughs> that the book of Revelation was about the future. Because that's the most central element of, of the future of the church. The last times would be its rapture uh, to go to be with God. <coughs> The uh, predominant group that holds this position is dispensational premillennialism. You may or may not be familiar with these two words. Premillennial simply means that this uh, school of thought believes that Jesus Christ will return before the millennium. In fact, his return will institute the millennium. Dispensational has other meanings, and uh, it, uh, it addresses... Uh, issues primarily about Israel and the role they play, if any, in the last day. Now, your dispensations believe they play a great role. Uh, <clears throat> question three. The blanks see the message of this book working itself out through successive eras of history. So this is a, another major way of looking at the book of Revelation. It's not common today, but it's the historist. 
that a historist for the people that, who believe that each of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 really made reference to an era of history. You know, the first church being the church of Ephesus would, would cover maybe the first two or three hundred years of the church. And then the next church would cover several hundred years. And through these seven churches, of course, all of the church age <coughs> would be covered. And then the end of the world would come. This was quite popular 500 years ago. It is not real popular today. And the major reason it's not popular today is simply because, I may forget to address some of these blanks, so you raise your hand and, if you would and keep me on track. The major reason it's not popular today is that <coughs> these church ages were laid out, you know, with a pencil and paper, so to speak, and, and all the important uh, people uh, in history, the great uh, personages uh, uh, through every era, and, uh, and then a hundred or two hundred years would come and more important things would occur. But then just scratch all that, and they started again and stretch it out another couple hundred years, and uh, the world didn't come to an end then either. And more important things happened, so they'd scratch all that, and they'd rewrite it again, and they'd keep trying to incorporate the history into the historist position, you see. And after a while, this got so embarrassing, that for the most part, they just threw up their hands and walked away and said, let's come up with something better than that. You know, that doesn't seem to work in any generation. So it's not real popular today. And then uh, point four. The blank advocated a symbolic approach to the book. Uh, the spiritualist. And they, quote unquote, spiritualize the content. Uh, they see uh, a story here of the engagement of good and evil in symbolic form. And these uh, uh, stories are applicable to any era. And they're not uh, necessarily rooted in history. Uh, they're uh, just simply uh, unique and powerful stories about uh, the, the engagement of good and evil in our life. And we are to apply that spiritually in some way to feel good about life. Uh, and so that's a common position. In fact, those are the uh, three most common. A lot of Presbyterians actually hold to a spiritualist position for what it's worth. Uh, as far as the dispensational premillennial uh, futurist position, you may recognize that as common to Baptist uh, churches. The historists we talked about as uh, being common for 500 years ago, that was uh, uh, more in line actually with a lot of Presbyterian, a lot of uh, re continental reformed churches subscribed to that for a while until they finally, you know, after so many uh, centuries passed, they couldn't make any sense out of it. Uh, it became less significant. The dispensationalists, however, if you uh, perhaps have been exposed to this in your past, actually have reached out and uh, embraced a certain element of historism in their own dispensationalism, and you will actually see them trying to incorporate periods of history into dispensationalism as well. You may have noted that. I, I'm not entirely sure, obviously, as to how much you, uh, background you have in the subject of prophecy. Uh, if you sat in a dispensational church, a Baptist type church for many years, you'd have probably gotten a lot of this. Because they like to preach on, you know, the, uh, uh, the you know, the Lord may come this year type sermons, or at least this decade at the latest, you know. And uh, you get a lot of sermons like that. Uh, thousands of them if you sit in that type of church, or, uh, which I you know, did for so many years. But uh, they, they embrace a certain amount of historism. Now, <clears throat> we come to uh, point five. The blank believe that most of the prophecies of this book have been fulfilled. And the word there is preterist. Preterist. Uh, preterist, that's a Latin word, and it means... Uh, something that has passed. And the Preterist's position is that the content, most of it, up, at least up through chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, 
has been fulfilled and is now past in our history. It was fulfilled in the first century. It was about the first century church and Judaism and such like. And there was the prophecy about critical times. Those times came and went by the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And when it was prophesied somewhere around 64, 65 AD, the book of Revelation, obviously the content was future, but it was uh, prophetically fulfilled soon thereafter and is now in the past. And that's the reason I entitled my book Back to the Future, and that you have to go back 2,000 years to get to a point where this is future, you say, because no longer future is fulfilled for the most part. Anybody ever heard of this? theological position before today, me mentioning it. I did in your previous class. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about when we were in Matthew. Is we that went right? there several, uh, the Olivet Discourse, yes. Okay. Now this position has uh, been around since the, uh, the third century or, or so. Um, and we can read it in some of the church fathers. But to be quite frank, many systems have been around all these years. You can read them in the church fathers. So Nothing is dominated through church history as a prophetic point of view. They all, uh, most of them have ancient roots. Uh, premillennialism does, but dispensationalism doesn't. That, uh, that is uh, something that saw its origin about 1830. And although today it's the dominant theological position of the church, dispensational premillennialism, uh, and in fact it is a recent innovation in the in prophecy, and uh, a lot of people don't know that. In fact, you tell the dispensational premillennialists that you're, uh, you embrace something that's relatively new in the theological scene, they will be surprised and shocked and may not believe you, because they're certain, from all the sermons they've heard, that it goes right back, you know, to the early church, and that's just a given in their mind. Uh, in fact, it does not. Does it go right back to the Great Britain? Yeah, in Great Britain in 1830, John Nelson Darby and uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Edwards. Uh, his name, I said my mind, his first name. Uh, Edwards was a Presbyterian minister. And Edwards was eventually uh, put out of the Presbyterian church because his uh, teachings and preachings and such like were so heretical that. Uh, he was put out of the church. In fact, uh, in his church in London, uh, we have the first modern expression of Pentecostalism, speaking in tongues. Uh, something that hadn't been in the church for uh, a thousand years or so uh, began to make its uh, return in the uh, early uh, 1800s in his church. And that and his prophetic opinions and such like, they got to the point where the Presbyterians couldn't tolerate him anymore and they put him out of the church. Uh, <coughs> the other fellow, John Nelson Darby, was part of what they call a Brethren Church. And the Brethren Church uh, has some unique, uh, uh, many unique doctrines, but uh, one of which was dispensationalism. Uh, you can ask questions as we go. In fact, we're on dispensationalism. And I just answer some of those questions. Dispensational premillennialism began in 1830, became widespread due to the due to the what? Translation. Uh, the, the final word Schofield. in that phrase is Bible. Due to the what Bible? Schofield. Schofield reference Bible. Without the Schofield reference Bible, I don't know that dispensational premillennialism would have survived. But that gave it a real life. In fact, uh, the notes in the, in the Schofield Reference Bible became almost, uh, in the minds of the users, inspired. Uh, I'm not saying absolutely so, but they were just uh, you know, deeply embraced. Um, and then you have other uh, reference Bibles that have taken the place of the old Schofield Reference Bible. You have a new Schofield Reference Bible. You have a Ryrie Study Bible, which is the same thing, basically, and uh, perhaps some others. In and of itself, the Study Bible is not necessarily a bad idea. I use one, 
and maybe you use the same one, the Reformation Study Bible, R.C. Sproul Editor. I like this a lot. Uh, I also use almost all my life the Schofield Reference Bible. <laughs> so I'm quite well aware of what it teaches, uh, having embraced it and believed it and defended it, uh, because that's all I knew. Baptist and premillennial dispensationalists can be a little ingrown. And uh, I have to admit, I fit that definition <laughs> very well for many years of my life. According to the dispensation of premillennialists, the blank are God's chosen people. Who's God's chosen people? You hear it all the time, not in this church, but in uh, broadly based evangelicalism in general. Who are the God's chosen people? Israel, the Jews. Israel, the Jews. You know. Now, I, I want to <clears throat> point out there's few things that annoy me more in life than the, that statement. Because it's, you know, it utterly flies in the face of the fact that the Church of Jesus Christ is God's chosen people. Instead, we pick an unsaved group of infidels and call them God's chosen people. Do you see the, you know, the horror of such a statement? Uh, but you hear it all the time. Now, the Jews are God's chosen people. I beg to disagree. I'm God's chosen people, as are you. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ is, uh, is, is really called the Israel of God by Paul in his, uh, in his letters and writings. But that's what characterizes that theology. Ralph, what was, what was the answers to 6 and 7, please? Um, the destruction of Jerusalem. Seven was the meaning of the name Preterus. Pass. Something that has passed. Thank you for asking. Thank, for thank you. Skip those. Don't let me do that. I get going. The once and for all blank of Christ makes the re, uh, this uh, rebuilding of the Jewish temple and the uh, reinstitution of sacrifices unlikely. I didn't mention the rebuilding of the temple and the reinstitution of sacrifices, but you hear them all the time, don't you? You know, we're just waiting. You know, we're going to build that temple. We got this this uh, uh, Islamic temple there, and some way, shape, or form, that's coming down, and you know, and the God's going to be rebuild His temple. He did, and it's in this room. It has nothing to do with Jerusalem and any temple that's going to be built there. If there was a temple built there, you'll, I hope you come to understand and believe, God ripped that temple down with his own hands in 70 AD as a defiance against everything that's found in Scripture. If there's never another one built, it'll be built in defiance of the God who tore the other one down. It has nothing to do with fulfilled prophecy. What was that again? The once and for all blank of Christ? Yeah, I didn't ask that question, but you ought to know. Death of Christ. <laughs> yeah. The sacrifice of Christ. Okay. So, I mean, that, why do you need another temple and, 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 and animal sacrifices? <laughs> Look at Hebrews. It just flies in the face of dispensationalism, does it not? Uh, making clear the fact that the, the, the once for all sacrifice of Christ does away with all of Judaism, is the point of the author of Hebrews. And the uh, crucifixion of Christ, the Temple of Baal, was written from top to bottom. It's the start of that. Well, we're going to sew it back up. <laughs> <laughs> Christ himself. <laughs> like years ago, I went to Israel and I studied historical geography and came back and went to several churches and shared my slides and experiences. And people said, are they rebuilding the temple over there? And they always asked me about that. No, we're rebuilding it right here in the community of faith. That's the temple of God, you see. So you'll get different theology in a Presbyterian church in America, uh, generally. Uh, yes. You won't necessarily get this eschatology. The Presbyterian church does not embrace a given eschatology. You probably know that. There are in Presbyterianism, in Presbyterian churches, amillennialists, historic premillennials, not dispensational premillennialists, postmillennialists, and uh, those that are or are not preterists. 
some of the people who are present. I like to mention the names because most people look at me like I'm a heretic, so I like to associate with myself <laughs> with good company. <laughs> so who believes this nonsense that you're teaching? Well, R.C. Sproul is a preterist. Jay Adams is a preterist. Uh, Hank Hennegraaff, anybody here at the Bible Answer Man? Uh, uh, Hank Hennegraaff is a preterist. Uh, Gary DeMar is a preterist. Uh, Ken Gentry. Ken Gentry is a preterist. You perhaps have heard of him. Uh, most of these are all of these men. Are, as I said, Jay Adams is a preterist. All these men are Presbyterians. But Presbyterianism has no... Uh, hold on preterism. I know of Methodists and Church of Christ even uh, and Baptists who are preterists. So, I mean, in fact, you can be a non-millennialist and be a preterist. Jay Adams is a non-millennial preterist. You can be a post-millennialist and be a preterist. R.C. Sproul, Ken Gentry, myself, others are post-millennialists. You can be uh, a historic pre-millennialist and be a preterist. I know of none, but you can. You know, theology isn't... Uh, dismisses. But why? Because all of these millennial statements, these uh, amillennial, postmillennial, premillennial, they have to do only with chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. The rest of the book of Revelation deals with the words we just discussed. Futurists, historists, uh, <coughs> what other word did I use? Spiritualists. What? Spiritualists. Spiritualists and preterists. They, all the rest of the book has to be uh, entertained in one of those four ways. And that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the millennium. It's, that's only entered us in chapter 20. Of the uh, why is the date, dating of Revelation, so important? Well, uh, most people, uh, scholars, whatever, believe the book of Revelation was written in the 90s, A.D. I do not. Uh, no preterist stuff. If the book of Revelation was written in 90 AD, then the story it tells about the destruction of Jerusalem, destruction of the temple, destruction of uh, Judaism, uh, would have therefore been written uh, in hindsight, having observed the events, and then there would have been a pretense that it was prophecy. So it would be a fraud. Is that? Since I don't believe the scriptures are fraudulently written, Therefore, it had to have been written before the events, assuming the events are what I discussed. And so my point of view is that it was written somewhere around 64, 65, 66, and it was fulfilled in a three and a half year period that uh, basically begun by the order of Nimrod to destroy Jerusalem. You see, that took place almost to the day, three and a half years after he issued the order. And why is three and a half significant? Because it's all through the book of Revelation, three and a half, three and a half, three and a half. Notice one thing you don't have in the book of Revelation in terms of years. There's never a seven year period mentioned in the book of Revelation. And yet we all know that Christ is going to come back, there's going to be a seven year <laughs> tribulation, and then <coughs> the dispensation of privilege and uh, point of view. But there's no seven-year period mentioned in the book of Revelation. <coughs> About a sevens, none of them reference the tribulation. It's always three and a half years. So they actually take two of these three and a half year units and put it together and make seven out of it. But the, the book of Revelation doesn't make that uh, connection. Any questions? <coughs> well, there's um, pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib pre-millennialist. Well, uh, again... That's all based on the idea that the book of Revelation talks about a return of Christ. I think it talks about a return of Christ too, and I'll explain that to you as we go. But not the return of Christ, not the second coming, which obviously you know, is yet in our future. But it is talking about a return of Christ. As Christ said in Matthew 24, this generation won't pass away before these things. I'm coming. And he did. And a judgment coming in AD 70. And the Bible is filled with judgment comings of God. You may or not be familiar with any of them, but there are a lot of them. And once you begin to aware of, the, aware of the fact that he often came in judgment and said so prophetically, then you will see that this threat and prophetic uh, statement that he was coming uh, fits into the tradition.
definition of this, the, the Old Testament of Scripture of judgment comings by God. Uh, on um, Israel, on Egypt, Babylon, Moab, judgment comings all through the Bible. You see. Always on the enemies of God. Still is in the book of Revelation. It's Judaism is the enemy of God at that point. You see. Uh, <clears throat> The internal and external evidence clearly point to the um, two, two words as a writer of Revelation. We didn't discuss the internal and external, but the apostle uh, John was the author of the book of Revelation. It's the only possibility. <coughs> you will read, again read, hundreds and hundreds of pages on who wrote the uh, book of Revelation, various John's uh, through the early church who played roles in the uh, church history and such like. But none of them uh, are even a remote candidate for the authorship of this book, only the Apostle John. The persecution of the early church came primarily from who? Judaism. From Judaism. Now, after the destruction of Jerusalem, it comes primarily from Rome. Rome. The point is, in the book of Revelation, the great enemy uh, of the uh, people of God is often portrayed as, as Jews. And Christ calls uh, uh, the Jewish synagogue in uh, chapters 2 and 3 of the book of uh, Revelation, what? Synagogue of Satan. You see? And so <clears throat> the great enemy of the church in the early years was Judaism. Rome didn't take notice of uh, the church for the most part until it had been ripped away from its union with Judaism. It was just a sect of Judaism, you see. And when the, that no longer was possible because Israel was destroyed, Jerusalem wiped out, the temple torn down, the church then began to stand out as a separate entity, and then that took the notice of Rome. And, and, and the, uh, uh, Rome became the you know, next enemy of the church. Uh, <clears throat> The reference to Jerusalem and the temple. What is the significance of the reference to Jerusalem and the temple in the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation does mention the temple. We're told measure the temple in the book of Revelation. It does mention Jerusalem, an old Jerusalem and a new one. What's the significance of that in terms of our date, for instance, uh, point of view? Well, the fact of the matter is, if Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed, we wouldn't be discussing it in the book of Revelation. It made history, you see. But because it exists, and it's something that can be measured, and something that can be discussed, then the argument is, therefore, this discussion took place before that destruction occurred. Therefore, the authorship of the book, Internal Evidence, would suggest before AD 70. Now, the political, historical situation in Revelation. I'll read you Revelation 17, 9 and 10. Here's the mind which has wisdom, which is a statement that says something to the effect that if you've got, you know, good sense, you'll be able to understand what I'm about to say. That's about what John is saying here. Here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has yet to come. And when he comes, he must remain a little one. Okay, that's the uh, symbolic language, the code, whatever you want to call it, that John's using to uh, discuss the uh, situa political, political situation of uh, the period in which he is discussing. Now, <clears throat> it's generally known that the seven hills refer to Rome. Rome has from antiquity, it's known as a city that sits on seven hills. Wasn't much of a cut. <laughs> Everybody knew what that was about. Uh, and there talks about seven kings. Five have died. Well, if you start counting the kings of the uh, emperors or Caesars of Rome, uh, you see that Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, uh, Gaius, Caligula, and Claudius did all die by 54, and they were the first uh, five to reign before uh, 
Julius Caesar, there were no emperors, it was a republic, and the, the empire changed at that point. Uh, the one that is, a Nero Caesar, uh, Caesar Nero, reigned between 54 and 68. And uh, my point is, that's when the, John wrote. He wrote during the period of the one who is. And <coughs> in fact, <coughs> he's the one that issued the edict to destroy Jerusalem. Uh, he died in 68 AD soon after issuing that edict. Well, he killed himself, actually. But that edict was in place and, uh, by that time. And the armies, uh, the Roman legions, had marched to Jerusalem and were actually engaged in war with Judaism by the time he died. The one that has not yet come, and uh, who is to reign but a little while, uh, Galba uh, took over after Nero died in June of 68, and he died in January of 69. So he was only in office about uh, six, seven months. And uh, in fact, there were three that were in office uh, just a few months before Vespasian became emperor. Now Vespasian was the one issued the order by Nero to destroy Jerusalem. So Vespasian was in Israel going about his job of making war when uh, Nero died. And the three emperors took his place, and Vespasian sat there and really watched what was going on in Rome. Finally got tired of it, and went to Rome and took charge, and became a, a, a long-standing emperor thereafter. His son, which was uh, a general in his army, stayed in Jerusalem to finish the job. His son was Titus, who later actually became emperor. So, I think the, uh, this historical information helps us place the book, the content of the book. If chapter 17, if this is the content of chapter 17, well, that content has come and gone. This book is rooted in that historic content, you see. Not rooted in something that who knows what's going to happen uh, in our future. Of course, it's always in our near future, you know, it's coming next year, next year, next year. Have you ever thought the fact that the Lord may not come for 10,000 more years? Most people have never thought of that. And they think about that and say, oh, that sounds like heresy. No. He may not come for 30,000 more years. We have no idea when the Lord's going to come. You say, it's just don't know. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and there's no need. You don't have anything to worry about. You're going to be in heaven long before 30,000 years from now. You say, it's not going to affect you in the least. <laughs> you say, no. Somehow or like we're missing something. The Lord doesn't come next year. You know, you're not missing a thing. You're going to be in heaven. You say. <coughs> Questions? What about the exhortation to watch and pray? Yeah, I'd recommend you do that. And that comes, <laughs> comes out of the book of, of Revelation, for that matter. And uh, the watching and praying is the coming of Christ and the uh, judgment coming. That's the context of it. Think about verses that are thrown at you all the time. They're thrown at you without context. And a lot of time when you go to the context, and it, you know, how you're using it and how it was written are unrelated. You see what I mean? You've got to get context. Uh, in fact, the whole book of Revelation, my contention, that the whole book of Revelation makes us utter nonsense because the context out of which it was written is uh, ignored. What's the context? Seven churches <coughs> were written a letter to tell them something that is to soon take place. That's the context. Uh, <coughs> do, do we not read the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his bond service the things which must soon take place? How about for the time is near? I am coming to you quickly. I am coming quickly. The third woe uh, is coming quickly. Behold, I am coming as a thief. There's the context of your verse. Uh, the things which must soon take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. For the time is near. Behold, I am coming quickly. Yes, I am coming quickly. Did you miss it? He said he was coming quickly. When this was written 2,000 years ago. Is 2,000 years quick? 
the thing, my point is, there's nothing quick about it. What would he have had to say to make the point that he was coming quickly? I mean, it's like, you know, by now he's throwing his hands up and said, how could you not get the point I was making? This was something that was going to happen quickly, soon, thereafter. And of course, if the book of Revelation was written somewhere in the vicinity of 64 to 66, could have been written 67, even <coughs> early part of 68, but I, I don't think so. 64, 65, 66. Now, 68 or so, when it begins to be fulfilled, that's quickly, that's soon. That fits the context of history, fits the contents of the emperors we discussed. But the, the time of statements are utterly essential for us to place the book in history. And you have, to, and people, I don't know how they do it, I, I did it, I guess. But you, you have to utterly ignore over and over and over and over again where John says this stuff is going to happen soon. <coughs> Uh, Christ himself said it, using different terminology, this generation won't pass away, for all these things are fulfilled. I did. I, I was discussing this with somebody the other day, and I said, well, what, what does that mean? This generation shall not pass. He goes, this generation. I said, the one we're in? He goes, yeah. And I said, so who was he speaking to 100 years ago, that generation? And he goes, well, whatever generation it happens in. <laughs> I said, so you're telling me you have no idea what this is talking about. Well, it has no, it has no context, it has no grammatical, historical roots in anything when you think and talk in those terms. You say, my point, I'm trying to make, you know, grammatical, historical reference in order to get the environment, the context in which the book took place, in history. And uh, if, Christ had said something about that generation, that generation shall not pass before all these things take place, then I'd be looking for what that generation was he was talking about, because obviously that would be something in the distance. But he said this generation, as he spoke. And so you look for the uh, fulfillment in that generation. Forty years later, which is considered a generation, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, almost exactly 40 because Christ was born about 4 B.C. And he, of course, lived about 33 and a half years. Do the math, and of course, add 40 years to that. 70 A.D. is you know, one generation. Did, did any of the early Christians at that time make the connection at all? Yeah. You find this in some of the uh, fathers, where they are making <coughs> this connection. And uh, do talk about um, <coughs> the destruction of Jerusalem being a fulfillment Christ, uh, Matthew 24. Uh, statement. I'm trying to think of a church father. Um, when you're on the hot seat like I am right now in front of an audience, you're forgetting these things. Uh, but, uh, famed church father, I remember Eusebius. James, uh, uh, famed church father. In fact, he's called the, uh, his, uh, the, the historian of the early church. He wrote a history of the early church in the fourth century. He makes these very comments. Uh, <clears throat> there are numerous time indicators that alert the first century reader that the fulfillment was near, at hand, this generation. Uh, it's taking the Bible seriously. That's what it boils down to. It's taking Christ seriously, taking John seriously. When he goes out of his way to give you time indicators, take them seriously. If you do, I think you get the context. I, might, I also might add, what in value would it be to these seven churches that John is writing to who are on the verge of great persecution and say, take heart, 2,000 years from now, Jesus is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and how does that help me today? You say, uh, that was written to people on the verge of suffering. And they were told to take heart because Jesus is coming soon, certain things are going to happen soon to advance the kingdom. Yes, I, and that makes sense in that context. Uh, futurists <coughs> uh, 
deal, uh, futures deal with the frequent references to time by saying that when he comes, then the events will be uh, quickly or fast. That's how they get around it. They say, well, what does mean? And they uh, change it. It doesn't say the Lord's coming quickly on this generation or anything else, but when he comes, boy, it's going to be fast. That's uh, not what the context of any of these verses say. But it's their explanation. They've got to come up with something, because they're well aware of the fact these verses are there. They've got to say something about it. Uh, <clears throat> so, some conclusions, and a lot of questions and answers, perhaps, to follow. The likely date that Revelation was written is... By now, you ought to have some answer. 64, 65, 66. Good likely period, three-year period there. Judaism is Christianity's greatest enemy. Jerusalem and temple still stood uh, when Revelation was written, indicating, of course, that the Revelation was written before AD 70, when Jerusalem and temple did not stand any longer. Emperor Nero still reigned. Time references indicate a, uh, an early day. The Alvin Discourse and Revelation are written in a first century setting. Um, so, <clears throat> I went through that pretty fast. I, did, I remember that uh, when I was at Columbia, uh, it's called International University now, and uh, James Hatch, whose son was here, spoke to our church. He had a course called Daniel Rev, Daniel Revelation, because there's a lot of references to Daniel Rev. How would you, uh, would you still agree with there's a lot of similarities? Oh, yeah, there's you know, multitudes of quotes, or not quotes. <coughs> Interestingly, John is the most Old Testament book in the New Testament in terms of its references. And yet there is no known quote in the book of John of an Old Testament passage. In other words, he weaves his writing with Old Testament phraseology and terms and such like, while not necessarily ever, ever quoting. When you read it and you know the Old Testament, you go, oh, that's Daniel, that's Ezekiel, that's Zechariah, that's, that's Isaiah. You know where he's getting his stuff, you're saying. He's immersed in the Old Testament, the most immersed and all of the New Testament, the next person who would come close to him would be the writer of the book of Hebrews, which is also a book deeply rooted in the Old Testament. Okay? Uh, notice how uh, Daniel concludes. Daniel, seal up the book. Because until the time is at hand. You know, obviously it's not at hand now, so seal it up. How does the book of Revelation end? Anybody know? Don't seal the book. Comes right out and says it. For the time is at hand. That's how the book of Revelation ends. Mm -hmm. Is that? I mean, what the stuff in Daniel? It's going to be three, four, five hundred years before that stuff starts playing out. Go ahead and seal that up. That's not going to happen soon. Book of Revelation. Don't seal it. The time is at hand. It's going to happen soon. Is that? You check chapter twenty-two of the book of Revelation. You, you'll see it there. Unless somebody moved it. It's still there. Questions? Why do you think John wrote in that uh, apocryphal, symbolic language rather than clearly stating in three years Israel's going to be destroyed? Mm -hmm. you know, why do you think he used all that symbolism? That well, you can ask that history? question about uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, and major portions of Isaiah as well. <clears throat> In other words, the ultimate author, God, why does he do that? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Not much of an answer. I don't know. <laughs> he just does that. You got an answer. You might illuminate me on that. But he does use symbolic language. And he tells you he's using symbolic language. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, and you are... Told, however, if you have wisdom, you're going to grasp this. You're going to understand it but time and time again. And you're expected to understand. Interestingly, the word apocalypse today is used, well, number one, it's used for uh, 
destruction and tragedy. And it's also used for a puzzle. You know, something that's apocalyptic that's puzzling, we can't figure it out. But the fact, the word apocalypse means revelation. It means the opposite of, uh, of hiding. Uh, it means revealing. Uh, so the book of Revelation, my point is, was meant to be understood. It was never meant to be a puzzle book. It was meant to be a divine revelation to be understood right there on the spot by that audience. My best guess is those seven churches got it. And they understood what was being said. Later became mysterious. Quickly became mysterious. Although people all through the centuries were talking in this preterist terminology about music up till this day. They continue to talk that way. Minority possession, to say the least. But it's, it's, it's an old one. And uh, it's embraced by uh, competent men. If it wasn't embraced by competent men, I'd been very reluctant as I began my study to in, you know, read a commentary by Herman Fenucci and say, oh, that sounds good, I'm going to go with that one. You know, who's Herman Fenucci? You, know, you see what I'm trying to say? It's the fact that not only in this generation, but through history, I can point out major the theologians who have embraced this position gave me confidence to look deeply into it myself. Can you remind us of your which aspect of my background? <laughs> um, your vast knowledge. Educational background? Sure. Is that what you're referring to? Well, yes. Okay. I did a Bachelor of Arts in Bible from Bob Jones University. Did some graduate work there. Later I did a Master of Arts in Counseling from Webster University. I did a Master of Divinity at Erskine Theological Seminary. I did a Master of Theology at uh, Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. And did a Doctor of Theology at uh, Reformation International Theological Seminary. So, there's too much. <laughs> and school too long. <laughs> but it did give me the tools to think deeply about these things. You need to, education is primarily best served if you're giving tools to work with, uh, you say. And that's why, you know, languages and other tool oriented. Uh, uh, educational uh, elements will, will allow you to uh, to get further in your life and thinking than will just pieces of facts, you know. But yeah, they gave me tools to, to think and to read and to follow and analyze and be comfortable uh, with this. Where was your counseling degree from? Webster University. Webster? That Missouri? It, it's their home, their home school, their office is in Missouri, but they have uh, campuses around the United States. Uh, Revelation, any questions about this? Okay, we're going to do some more uh, introductory material. I'm going to creep forward through some introductory material because starting in chapter 1, verse 1, without this, I think would would be a, a wash of it at, at sea. And so this will lay some foundation. And then we will hit uh, the chapters and uh, try to answer the questions you have. You, you know, reading Revelation, you think it's a great mystery. I know, I was reading it today. And I thought to myself, I need to get my country to look that one up. I can't remember what that means. <laughs> you know? uh, it, it's, it, it, there's a lot of confusion there. And that's why you take notes, you see, to remind yourself what your research has brought to bear. You know, that's what a book like this is, is research notes.